program, uh, we're going to switch Allison and Pierre. So Allison Kudla is going to come and speak next. She is coming from the Institute for Systems Biology uh, in uh, Seattle. And I first saw Allison's work at um, an exhibition called Biodesign uh, at the MoMA. It was a groundbreaking exhibition. And um, I think her work, uh, which you'll probably see, um, was one of the highlights for me. And then I had the pleasure of meeting um, Allison later and um, becoming a, cl a collaborator with her on a Keck Foundation grant that we have been working on, I guess, for the past three years. So um, besides her incredible bio that you can read uh, on there, uh, Allison is, a, I can say personally, an amazing uh, collaborator and a, just a great person to know. So uh, welcome, Allison Kudla. Thank you, Andrea. That was a wonderful introduction, and it's so great to be here. All right, so I'm going to be talking about this idea of the universe as an operating system and a framework for creating art. My talk is broken up into four sections. So the first section is basically a theoretical overview, and then I move right into the works that um, kind of typify that framework. And then at the end, I will talk about, about what I do at the Institute for Systems Biology and also um, talk about the consilience program. So this idea, um, so one of the hallmarks for me for making artwork is really to think about this feedback loop between matter and meaning. Um, it's something that maybe can be taken for granted, but um, I, I continually bring myself back to it because I think it's really important and critical. So if I have an idea or um, I, I imagine something and then I, I choose material to kind of render it, um, I want to make sure that that material is informed by the um, idea uh, in some cases, I might need to develop new materials or techniques, um, and you know, such as the case with this high-speed time-lapse photography. And then, and, and on the flip side, uh, materials will speak back, you know, and uh, it could change your idea. So being able to be flexible and fluid, and pay attention to that feedback loop and that interchange is is critical. Another is this transition in, that we've seen in art um, from objects to systems. It was Jack Burnham in the 70s who first kind of spelled it out as systems art um, and it's uh, moving away from traditional materials and art objects being on um, a plinth or hanging on a wall but rather looking at works of art that are in dialogue with their environments um, or interactive or have um, a system process going on or dynamic. Um, basically uh, this can be uh, an example could be the spiral jetty. Another example might be art that incorporates engineering and computation. Um, and so at the time at which I was finishing my Bachelor's of Fine Arts, I was working in the art and technology department. And a lot of my work was systems art. Um, but the kind of primary um, place or uh, area where I was kind of creating was a computer's operating system. And then I was deploying the works to an audience, uh, which is obviously human and biological. <laughs> and so um, at that time, uh, at the time I finished my BFA, I began looking for what to do next. And I heard about a new PhD program in, in the studio arts, which was rare for the US. And it was at the University of Washington's um, Center for Digital Arts and Experimental Media. So I was actually in the first wave of this program. And um, I knew with a name like Digital Arts and Experimental Media that I would probably be you know, continuing along doing more um, uh, art and tech work. Um, but what I didn't expect was that um, Sean Brixey, the co-founder of the or, sorry, of the department, had a wonderful practice around this idea of emulation. And he wrote a brief manuscript with James Coop. And this um, is where I first came upon this concept of the universe as an operating system. So Sean was my committee chair and um, really uh, kind of pushed me to think um, outside of the box, if you will, about what this kind of digital arts program was that I was in. And uh, that kind of provocation was highlighted by this word called emulation. And um, he asked a provoking question, what is the difference between a perfect simulation and an emulation? And it got me really thinking about 
again, this idea of what is the operating system for my work? Am I making a digital or virtual work? Or could I think about the universe as my operating system? And that really opens things up. Um, I was also at the time interested in relational aesthetics and thinking about the audience and the way the audience perceives the work and um, how that uh, in itself is a feedback loop. And so I uh, wanted to start making works that were on this kind of tangent. and. Um, Sean's work is very much about physical um, phenomena, but I was super interested in biological phenomena. And so I started asking questions like, what algorithms are running on biological systems? How are they different than physical or computational systems? Because again, in my context, I, I'm getting a degree where people are mostly focused on computer science and engineering and, and the arts. And so how can I make this life sciences stuff make sense? Um, in this context, this brand new context. And then finally, how can I find elements of the human experience in other living entities to kind of close that loop for the viewer? So I put together a list of kind of processes that characterize what I call behavioral aesthetics and what I was calling of this art is biological systems art. <laughs> and there's quite a few um, ideas on this slide, um, but certainly not all of them. <laughs> and uh, I've worked on a uh, good portion of them. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, circadian rhythms, but we'll also get into differentiation and growth, plasticity and senescence, communication and response. So, so this is all, again, work that I was doing when I was at DX Arts. And um, I hadn't made a robot before. <laughs> I had certainly worked with sensors and um, basic electronics, but um, I got the opportunity to work in machine shops and, and learn a lot about these processes. And uh, I became fascinated by phototropic movement in plants. And I um, found this plant called the oxalis plant, which has a phototropic behavior where when it is not photosynthesizing, as you can see in the top left, its leaves are closed. And when it is photosynthesizing, they open. And I assumed it's because, you know, the sun shines and it's a response to the sun. Um, but in darkness, they also open their leaves. And so then I went down a rabbit hole of learning a lot about circadian rhythms in plants and decided that the most poetic thing I could do was to create a sort of biological clock where the um, organisms were deciding when the sun would rise. <laughs> and so I created um, this sensor mechanism that basically watch to see when the plant started to lift its leaves. And then if it saw that happen, it would turn its overhead light on. So that's that. And again, as I mentioned, I was learning a lot about fabrication technologies. And um, one of those major technologies at the time was CNC um, machining or 3D printing. CNC basically stands for computer numeric control. So you have kind of computer code that's telling a plotter where to go. And, and this is, you know, what laser cutters use and 3D printers. Um, and so I was learning about that while on the other side of the coin studying cell biology. And I found out about undifferentiated plant tissue, which um, I was fascinated by. And well, I was kind of over the whole, let's make some plastic trinket thing. And I thought, I want to try to make my own printer that extrudes something living. Um, so I thought, why not undifferentiated plant tissue? Um, in the first iteration, it got some contamination, and I ended up moving in a direction that was a little bit more um, tenable for myself. And uh, what I did was I basically created a project that has auger, algae, and seeds in the mixture, and then it's deposited into a fractal pattern. And then it rests on a capillary mat that has the moisture and nutrients necessary to promote um, growth. And so, oh, and this is what it looks like kind of from far away. It's um, aluminum and glass and fluorescent lights. And it has a kind of slick machine-like quality to it. And then when you get up close, you see the very um, verdant um, and somewhat messy growth that this machine is laying down. So got a video. And this is sped up, but you can kind of get a sense of how it moves. I think the, yeah, this last one is that real speed. A lot of people wonder, you know, okay, I've made this CNC machine. Why have it draw this? Or why not have it draw 
a face or write a word, and I certainly could have done any of those things. Um, but again, I wanted to be in a dialogue between matter and meaning, and the original intent for this work was to have the differentiation of a living organism be in dialogue with a um, computer, basically. <laughs> and so uh, that was not um, within my technical scope at the time. So. What I chose to do was, um, well, I was reading a lot, and I found a book that was called Philip Ball's The Self-Made Tapestry, and I highly recommend it. And in it, he looks at um, patterns all across nature. And um, that one that we just saw is the pattern that I have the machine draw. And it basically draws from the center outward. And um, it's called the Eden Growth Model, like I said, and it um, is a diffusion-limited aggregation model, which essentially means that it's looking for space, resources, and the existence of neighbors. And if it has those three things, then it extends. <laughs> so it's a, basically a surface fractal, and it's been witnessed in both urban sprawl and bacterial growth. So I thought it was a nice multi-scale model to have this machine um, that can grow <laughs> um, be representing. So uh, this diagram shows the seeds um, life cycle. So another thing to think about is obviously this is you know a living system. So the time scales I'm working with have to be based on the life cycle of the organisms, um, you know, not the frame rates or uh, the amount of time that an audience member will be able to watch it. Um, so obviously I'm thinking about those things, but the overall creation of the work has to take into consideration the lifespans of the organisms. And so um, I ended up using rapid cycling brassica seeds, and they sprout within three days and have a full life cycle after a month, roughly. So it was a good choice for this piece because it allowed me to have it draw a little bit each day for a full month. And so by the end of the month, um, well, here's one that has a lot of growth. So this is after like 28 days. Um, the places where there was a lot of growth. Well, at first you see the seeds sprouting in the center first, and it's a bit like a city where there's these little plants and it's the old growth in the center, and then the new sprawl that's yet to become high rises. <laughs> and um, anyway, as it keeps growing, the plants start to flop and it gets very messy. Um, but it's, it's exciting to me that um, this thing kind of is letting go of a matter that you don't know if it's inert or not, and then a few days later, you see these beautiful leaves. And the lines kind of start to recede uh, after some time, especially if the plants grow a lot. <laughs> and so um, I had fun with these seeds and was asked to make a work of art for a wall. And it was not meant to be up for a long period of time, very short term installation. And I got to this wall and I was captivated by the skylight. And it might be because I, I live in Seattle and I'm a little bit sun deprived. <laughs> but I kept looking up at that skylight. And whenever the sun would pass by, it would leave these beautiful um, patterns on the wall. And I would just kind of watch the patterns move. And I decided, OK, um, let's make an artwork about reaching towards nourishing sunlight. And so that's what tenacity is. And so I made my own seed paper, and I put um, it on that capillary mat, applied it to the wall, and saw so much, it, it made me feel so much joy to see them growing up like that. And then I used these seeds again for an installation that was in a, a darkened kind of small room. So you would walk into the room and see this kind of glowing, like, sparkly nebula, and as you got closer, you saw that um, some of those uh, little dots were actually um, growing seeds. And um, yeah, inspired by this idea of a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. So as I mentioned before, I was studying cell biology and um, really wanted to do a work with tissue culturing and not seeds. Uh, so I decided to explore it by making a project called Growth Pattern. This is the one that was in biodesign. And um, it's, it's a pretty complicated uh, project. Um, but essentially what I was trying to do is um, 
look at the plasticity of living cells and frame them within our human understanding of a botanical pattern so that the living plant cells can kind of emerge their own pattern within this yeah, human uh, representation of a botanical pattern. And so to learn about how to culture cells, I learned a little bit about how plant cells work. And plant cells are basically like all stem cells. So totipotent means that any cell in the plant can become any organ in the plant. And what controls that are a couple of growth regulators. And I was kind of jaw-droppingly excited to find out that it's just these two um, growth regulators that can adjust whether a cell becomes a leaf or a root. And if you just toggle it, it'll go leaves, and the other direction it'll go roots. And if they're completely equal, that's when you get undifferentiated tissue. And I, it was just exciting to me to know that it's, it's sort of, you know, maybe it is something I can understand how these things work. And so I decided to focus on this to grow more leaves from plant cells. So this is a, uh, it's going to be a time-lapse video of a very small circular disc that I cut from a leaf and placed into growth medium that had the nutrients necessary to grow new leaves. And um, it's already a little bit, the leaves are already starting to grow a little bit, but you can see it better as I play it. Um, so you can imagine these are really tiny leaves that are coming out of the end of these cells. And so what happens is at the edges, it grows callus tissue, and then from there, these new shoots appear. The water droplets are condensation. It's really clear on my screen. Hopefully you guys can see that too. Right, so again, as I mentioned, I was looking at botanical patterns and arabesque patterns resonated with me a great deal. They are bilaterally symmetrical and radially symmetrical, basically looking at the essence of how veg vegetable systems work. So they grow up from the center, leaves are bilaterally symmetrical. And so it seemed like the right choice to be what I'm kind of stamping out of this leaf. And so initially I used a laser cutter, but I found that making dyes um, was much more appropriate. And so I tried to be very methodical about how I cut these leaves um, so that the line of symmetry for the tile was in relationship to the line of symmetry of the leaf. And then you can see how all of these tiles are exactly the same pattern, but then they rotate and connect, which allows it to be a more complex pattern. And so everything starts out looking nearly the same. But as you can imagine, the process for tissue culturing is quite labor intensive. What you have to do is sterilize the tissue, but you can't over sterilize the tissue because if you do that, the leaves will die, the cells will die. And if you under sterilize, then you'll have unexpected contamination like mold and bacteria. And so then there's this kind of invisible sweet spot that you don't know if you hit or not <laughs> when you're doing this and you get the new leaf growth. So it's, it's a very radical transformation that occurs when they all start out looking roughly the same and then end up in these three buckets that I just described. So perfect balance, we have all these shoots, um, not enough sterilization, and there's um, actually those, that fungus that's growing is growing in a, already in a symmetrical pattern, probably because it existed on the leaf, and then I translated it as I placed it into the dish. Um, and then finally, this faded out one, those leaves, or those cells looked green in the beginning, but not long after they turned brown because they had been over sterilized and died. And this is presented at a fairly large scale so that people can um, basically look on from an angle of getting close and also kind of from far away. Um, and basically see differences between dishes and to come back and look at those changes over time. So it has that 
quality as well. And I have a video of an aerial view. This is two months. And so, yeah, it does not last forever. And then I'll often make digital prints of the beginning and end state. However, the process of creating these works is very labor intensive. So to be able to go back and take photos uh, is not always possible. Um, and this is my um, protocol, which I took directly from an existing protocol for plant physiology, um, tissue culturing and for the tobacco leaf. Uh, I forgot to mention, that's tobacco. And um, the idea of cutting it into a shape is kind of my contribution to this. And um, this is Greet Clerks. I worked with her in Hasselt, and they wanted the piece to be up for longer than the dishes could allow. So what I did was I kind of gave her the rundown of how to take care of and do this project. And then I didn't get to get phone back to Belgium because she was able to do it for me. And I think this is a good example of what it means to have kind of a score or um, an instruction book of how to make an artwork. And then every time it's a little bit different. <laughs> so I've, I've collected some pictures, some um, at the end of one of the exhibitions, all of the growing um, tiles we put together and got a photo of. That's the contaminated one. And then this is a close-up of, it's hard to see on the screen, but um, very large frond that's done incredibly well in the dish. And I've presented this in many cities. This is in Rotterdam. And one of the things that I really appreciate about this project is I need um, a sterile hood and volunteers. And so a lot of times arts organizations or museums will make connections with um, biology departments to be able to produce my work. And I get to go into a new lab, meet new people, and get help with these projects. And recently I showed it in um, San Francisco, and we had a really hard time finding a spot that could accommodate the space and everything that I needed um, on the budget that we had. And I ended up um, working at the high school there in Alameda, which was super awesome. And everybody there was really nice, and I got a lot of help, and that was great. And I also, you know, as the person who's choosing the pattern. I mean, I love doing that sort of thing, but I also like the idea of other people getting to make the pattern. And so I was trying to figure out a way to make that possible. And the Olympic Sculpture Park run by the Seattle Art Museum invited me to do a workshop for um, basically their Saturdays in the park program. And so I came up with this uh, idea of having people go to the park and find some nature and then put it under a webcam that has custom software that's basically making a kaleidoscope. And people had a lot of fun with it. As you can see, they didn't just put plant matter. Sometimes you might see some scissors pop up or a napkin. <laughs> but yeah, it was fun to be able to move into the community. And I look forward to doing more projects like that. So. Now on to the project that I'm working on with Andrea, as well as Paul Weiss, Ruth West, um, Beth Cartier, and Niccolo Cassis. Uh, we all met at the National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative. And um, this is an, was an interesting conference where we basically were put in a room with each other and given a challenge. And that challenge was non-invasive ways of monitoring the microbiome. And um, one of the things we came up with was this idea of how can we creatively collaborate with our microbiome and what sort of signals are they sending to us that we can easily measure. And so the idea of a, a gut grumbling came up and the idea of using acoustics came up. So me being the kind of want to just get my hands dirty right away kind of person, um, went ahead and got um, a stethoscope and hooked it up to a digital recorder and I recorded my gut sounds. <laughs> and I added a layer of a computer voice, which you'll hear. So 
So yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about all of the different sounds that our, our bodies make and what would happen if there was um, a machine or an artificial system taking all of that data and somehow making sense of it for us, tracking its cycles and its rhythms. And uh, the idea of thinking of it as a weather system came up in our group. And so I created this kind of dashboard of what a day might look like or a week might look like in the life of a person um, who's monitoring their microbiome in this way. And this ended up being used to create a large format light box photograph with a photographer, Kevin Scott. And um, we embedded the dashboard there. And this scene, this is a person who cares a lot about his health enough to have one of these trackers, but you know, he's human. And every once in a while he wants Chinese takeout and to drink a little too much vodka. And so he woke up in the morning and it said, turbulence expected. <laughs> and they gave him some recommendations, or sorry, the artificial system did. And um, the fridge is flung open and we can see that, they're, that he's doing a little bit of bio tinkering. And there's also a nice cat there in the corner and helping us to remember that our um, microbiomes are shared with um, all of the living things around us. So um, to kind of end, I want to talk a little bit about where I work. So I am at the Institute for Systems Biology. And this, was, uh, this is a nonprofit that was founded in 2000. Um, it is a mostly biomedical research organization. The main founder, uh, well, I shouldn't say main, but the, the founder who is still there um, is, uh, that I work with is Leroy Hood. And he's known for automating the DNA sequencer. And he has this idea of an iterative cycle in biology and really a pioneering concept of integrating biology with technology and computation. Again, the institute was founded in 2000. And you can understand why this might be um, a paradigm that he works from. Because of the invention of the DNA sequencer, you know, there's all of this now data that's brought to biology. And that you know, requires new software, new computational spaces. And then that gives us new hypotheses, and so the cycle repeats. And so it's a very um, innovative and iterative culture. It's very collaborative and cross-disciplinary. Computer scientists working with biologists, phys physicists, you know, the, it's a very integrated place. Um, but my role there is actually in the communications department. So I am their in-house um, graphic and web designer. And sometimes I get to work on the research side. And these are a couple of examples where I got to do that. So um, they got a paper published in Nature Biotech, a pretty great paper about the Pioneer 100 data, which I will not go into because it's a lot. And um, uh, I helped to make the cover. And then this, uh, this project was about stratifying cancer and coming up with icons to easily remember what the subtypes of gastric cancer that they discovered were. But beyond just doing graphic and web design, I'm also um, kind of the caretaker of a program called Consilience. And Consilience is a word made famous by E.O. Wilson in a book he wrote in the late 90s. And it is um, kind of what uh, we use to talk about this idea of um, the Institute not being cross-disciplinary only to science, technology, and um, computation, but also bringing in the humanities, social sciences, and arts. And it's very difficult to make organizational change at that level. Um, so what we are doing is having these sort of cultivation events that raise awareness. And consilience um, at this moment has been basically a, a symposium that happens once per year where we invite um, speakers who are already doing integrative work. and um, we just launched the one that will be happening in May. So if you can make it to Seattle, please visit systemsbiology.org slash consilience for more info on that event. They're always free, um, and they're usually just in the afternoon of a Friday. But yeah, beyond that, I would love consilience to be more than um, a symposium. And it would be great to really start making a change in this organization and really creating new knowledge by bringing these um, d different groups together. Um, so it's kind of a challenge as to how to make this happen, and that's not a challenge I've quite solved yet. I've applied for some grants and certainly um, take on whatever help I can. For example, um, an intern who had heard me speak 
asked if he could come and work on the consilience program over the summer. And I said, sure, come on. And he got funding from his university. And um, so he came on board. And this is, again, in addition to all of the work I'm doing. So I'm doing this because I love it. And um, so the idea that I kind of put in his lap was this idea of Waddington's epigenetic landscape as it relates to gene regulatory networks, which are currently visualized in um, a very complicated circuit board-esque manner. And so he worked with some of the researchers and scientists and kind of let me know that he wanted to do something with physical computing. And in less than eight weeks, he produced this um, pretty cool uh, little maquette of um, the epigenetic landscape. This is sped up, obviously, um, where these little ball bearings move. Um, and the uh, underlying algorithm is based on the logic circuit that we saw on the previous screen. So I think that's going to wrap up my talk for the most part. I have some other projects on the way, but they're still kind of under wraps. So if you have any questions, thanks. Yeah, I mean, my hope is that, um, so one of the reasons that I make work like this is I like to be surprised myself by the things that I'm making. Um, it, it adds an element of joy to the process of creating art that wouldn't be there otherwise. So while I do design machines, one of the things I love about working with biology is not knowing exactly how it's going to turn out. Um, and I think that my hope for the audience is that they would be curious um, enough to ask, start asking questions about it and maybe learn a little bit more than they knew prior about the plasticity of a plant cell, for example. And in a way, that's, that's been also the way that I have found inspiration in science and, you know, on wonder. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so I, I certainly um, have a project that is around the corner that hopefully that would involve the audience, but not um, in the food aspect. So I can very clearly say that that is not a domain that I am working in. It's not my intention, but I can obviously see why if you see sprouts, you would think food. <laughs> Yeah. Also, it's a can be a bioindicator of ozone, uh, for example, the leaves will change color. And why did you choose tobacco for this? Um, so it was the most easy to find protocol, honestly, and the leaves were large enough to create a pattern. So I have a feeling that protocol exists because it's a cash crop. Um, but yeah, there wasn't um, a kind of climate-oriented reason. Yeah. Uh, have you tried directing them to be roots? I actually haven't. Others have, though. I've seen pictures.